Yeah, just in time. So, welcome to this second session. And welcome to the office right now, who will tell us something about um, how you can make sure that your um, optimizations that you built into your fancy library still hold up a, some weird refactoring, whatever change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm supposed to use this thing. Uh, if it's so loud, then we'll have to okay. tune it down. Is this fine for everybody? Can you hear me? All right, welcome. Um, who in the audience has actually programmed in Haskell before? Just to get a good idea. Okay, that's good. Because this is maybe a slightly more advanced talk than I would expect at BobConf, um, but I think I have the right people in the audience, so I think we're fine. Um, so I have my talk, but really, what I care about is what you want to hear, so there's a lot of stuff in the end that I can do faster or skip, so if you have any questions during the talk, any comments, uh, we can make this as interactive as you want, and it'll be as much more fun if, if you make this interactive, so please, anytime you feel like you want to say something, um, please do. So I'm going to, this is very, very scared by my own voice, it's coming back from the back. Maybe I'll move to the <laughs> That's better uh, for me. <laughs> for you. Um, okay, I want to start the story with an anecdote that has happened over the course of, I guess, three years now. Um, and it all starts with Matthew Pickering giving a talk about a library he created called Generic Lens at IFL, which is a small Haskell academic Haskell workshop in Bristol in 2017. Now, some of you might be confused. This isn't Matthew Pickering. This is Tonga Kiss, and this isn't IFL. This is ICFP. But it's the same project, so it's a good enough picture. Um, <laughs> and I, keep, I kept confusing these two people anyway all the time, so uh, I didn't have a picture of him talking about it. And um, well, in order to tell you what this generic lens library is about, I need to talk about lenses. So maybe let's repeat the question earlier. Who has programmed with lenses in Haskell before? OK, that's pretty good. So I guess I can be fast in the lens. Uh, what is lens about? I mean, I don't want to talk, turn this into a lens tutorial. But I just want to give you a very brief glimpse of why lenses are cool and why we want them. Um, so imagine you're working with some data type, uh, employee maybe, it has fields, one for the name, one for the age of the employee. And then likely you need some code to, if you have your employee, you want to know the age of the employee. And maybe you want to change the age, probably once per year or something. Uh, so you'll write some boilerplate code like this. Um, but this quickly gets tedious um, because if you imagine you have, well, this is a small data type with two fields. Uh, really, in practice, you have many more fields and there's lots of code to write. So this is annoying. Um, what's also annoying is that if you just have getters and setters like this to get a value for a field out of a data structure and put it back in, um, <coughs> once you start nesting data structures, it becomes really tedious to update a value because you need to reach all the way in, get the, like, maybe the, um, maybe you want to change the age of the head of the department of your company. So you have nesting data structures, you reach all the way in, you get the age, and then you need to modify, but you need to modify it at every level. So if you do it naively, you get some quadratic overhead, and it's lots of code to write, it's not pleasant. Um, so somebody came up with a very nice um, abstraction called a lens. And what a lens is, it's, you take the idea of the position of the age inside the employee data structure, and you make that a first class value, something that you can give a, a, a name and a type, and you can pass it around. Um, and then you can use this description of the position of the int in the employee, um, together with one of those very scary looking lens operators, which look like line, line noise if you, if you start doing it for the first time. And you can take uh, the lens and an employee and get the age out of it using this view operator. And you can <coughs> take the lens and a new age and you can get a setter out of it that modifies the employee. So instead of writing first order code that just does the operation, you abstract over the idea of the field inside the data structure and then you have 
a whole bunch of combinators to work with them. And what's even better is that they now compose nicely, so if you have a lens for um, the, the boss of a department, then you can compose it with the lens that gives you the age of an employee, and then you have a, it's an abstract concept, the idea of the age of the boss of the department. And you don't have the quadrat quadrat quadratic overhead for reasons that we don't want to get into here. But where does this lens come from? Come from? Now you could write it by hand. It's actually not too bad. It's not a lot of code. Um, um, I want to explain why this is a lens and why it works. Just you see, it's a reasonable amount of code for dealing with a position in a data structure. But again, if you have many fields, if you have, um, then this just becomes a lot of code to write that you don't want to write. Um, and of course, in practice, people don't don't write this by hand. The, the classic way of solving this problem is template Haskell. Template Haskell is the meta language, meta programming language of Haskell. So you can think of it as it's Haskell code that runs when you compile your program to produce the source code of the program that you then actually compile. And you can use this to generate all this code that you need here. But some people don't like template Haskell. It's a bit um, opaque. It's hard to see what's happening really. It's sometimes not typed if you don't do it the, the right way. Um, it, it causes headaches for people who want to do cross compilation. Um, and then probably there are more like gut feeling reasons why people don't like template Haskell. But still, it was the most practical way of getting a lens if you need one. Um, until this talk or this project by Matthew Pickering and Songa Kiss about generic lens. And what, what they allow you to do with this library is you don't even have to define the lens. You just can just get it out of thin air using a, a number of basic combinators that they provide, where you just say, okay, uh, remember that this is where we had the lens before. Now, when I write this code, I just say, I want to have the field of type int in the data structure that we're that we being passed here. And here, I do the same thing. And it doesn't even have to be uh, by type types. If, if your data type happens to be a, a record, then you can even use uh, the record name there. So basically, this allows you to, um, I mean, I like to make jokes in my talk, but uh, I want to get them as well. <laughs> um, right, so, so this give, gives you an ability to just write data structures as before you use records um, if you like. And then when you need a lens into a field, you just say uh, field um, and the name of the record, and it just produces its lens out of the name. And the way it does this is really cool um, because it's using two concepts that are fancy and intriguing uh, generic programming and type level computation. And you can see the generic programming showing up there that you need to derive this generic type class for your data types. But THG can do it for you. You don't have to write instances. It's just you say, okay, I want to have a generic instance for that. And what this does is, or what is generic program? So if you, if you look at the employee data type, really this is the same, has the same information as a plain simple pair of a string and an int. So really I'm just redefining a pair beginning with a new name and maybe some, some field names, but in terms of what data is there, it's the same. And in this sense, we can think of the pair, string and int, as the generic version of this concrete data type. And generic programming is the idea that there's many tasks that you have to do about programming, um, where you do lots of, write lots of code about your concrete data types that you've defined yourself, that you could just abstract, uh, just express once for the generic version, and then you can get it for all your data types, because well, all your data types are basically uh, pairs of values, and, and if you have a sum type, then it's just like an either of values. So generic programming is the idea, you take a, you write operations on generic data types of which there's a, a small number, a small number of building blocks like tuples, and then you can use these operations on your concrete data types. Um, so what this field age thing here is doing is it's essentially taking the, the employee, turning it into its generic data type uh, version, which you can think of just as a pair of um, string in it. And then it produces a lens that works on, on the pair, simply by looking at the second field. 
And if, for example, in, in for when you use it like this, then you convert the like you take the employee, you convert into the tuple, uh, you modify the second field, and then you can convert it back. And it uses type level programming, which is fancy word for like type classes and slightly more advanced features like type families and things, um, so that it you know you specify the name of the record and then. Uh, at compile time, using using fancy type classes, you can think of it. Um, it finds the right position in the data type where you have this uh, field called age. So they take these two concepts, generic programming and type level computation, and they provide this library, which is so has an elegant way of getting lenses. It's, it's really pleasing. I was sitting there and I was thinking, this is this is cool. Um, so I was very fond of this work. But I was sitting there thinking, I wouldn't use it. Any idea why I might have might think that I wouldn't want to use it? Performance. Thank you. Why are you worried about performance? Because you have to unwrap mm. uh, your generic thing. Pre precisely. I mean, this is a small data type. Turning an employee into a pair probably doesn't <laughs> find that very um, cost costing. But it, there's no runtime representation, right? Is well, generic. No, generic tapes have a runtime representation. They're just constructors. They're called colon, star, colon, and things. And um, if you use the to wrap and wrap from wrap functions from generic, you, you do that at runtime. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, for, for this one might be okay, but obviously use these features if you have big data types, then converting a big data type or maybe in a, a big nested data type to generic and back. Um, I mean, that didn't sound like it would be a good idea. So at the talk, I asked, so Matthew, um, how expensive is it compared to just the manual or the, the derived lens? And then, like you, he said, well, it's for free. It's, it's the same. It doesn't cost you anything. The compiler optimizes it all the way. And I didn't believe that. And I, I've worked on the optimizer of GHC. So I thought that I had an idea of what, what it can do and what it can't do. So I was very skeptical. But uh, yeah, I didn't want to to embarrass him in front of everybody, so I didn't continue this uh, during the talk. But then I went home and I looked at the paper that they wrote about this. And indeed, in the conclusion, they make this very bold claim, um, pretty good, increase, increase the focus of this projector, uh, the confidence that the abstraction will be without cost. So they make it black and white, this claim that this will, will be free. And I looked at the paper, how they, I mean, they also gave some arguments why they believe it's free, and what they did is they, well, they wrote the, the generic version of the lens that they derived, and the, they wrote the lens by hand in the same file, and they compiled it with optimization on, and they looked at the intermediate code that GHG produces and compared it after optimizations, and they said, oh, they are the same. And yeah, that, that's a pretty compelling argument. If the compiler takes two pieces of function, two, two functions and compiles them to the same code, then obviously the performance will be the same. Still didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, is this, I guess this might be better white on black. Um, any prefer preferences? Okay. Um, so here's the um, here's the code. Um, the data type that we just seen, uh, the generic lens derived by looking at the field, and then the manual lens that is written by hand. Um, fun fact, you don't need to import a lens library to use lenses. Um, this is the de definition of a lens. just uses functor and, and basic stuff. And it's compatible with the lens libraries. So just as an aside. So at this point, I think I was using TG 8.2. So I compiled the example with optimization. Important, otherwise it's meaningless. Um, I want to, the compiler to dump the output um, of the intermediate optimized code, uh, the simplified code to me. And also I want to use the package generic lens of the version at this point, which was 4.0.0.0. And this is what the intermediate code looks like. Um, basically GHG compiles Haskell into a, into, um, into a language called core, which is a bit like Haskell, it's still functional, it has data types and these things, but a lot of the sugars disappeared, 
a lot of types appear because it has explicit type application and abstraction. We don't need to understand the code at this point. It's really just, um, it's, yeah. I mean, the, the interesting part is, okay, here's the manual, manually uh, written lens in it. It's similar to what we got before. It's not much bigger, there's the F map, um, there's some extra bookkeeping for types. And here's a generic version. So here it begins. And uh, I think I should sc scroll by pages, maybe. Page, page, and this page, is all at runtime? Page, page. page. I just uh, generated. Uh, this is what will be compiled in runtime. Uh, it will be compiled first, or? Well, this will be This is after optimization. So all the operations that we see here are actually going to be performed at runtime. Um, and then, still going on. I mean, okay, to be honest, a lot of the code is actually um, type applications and stuff, so. Um, but, but still, they are. It's manifestly doing this conversion to the generic and back. So I was right. <laughs> and then I went to GitHub and said, hey, um, okay, I, I say, um, Songor, I should have been Matthew who gave the talk. As I said, I kept confusing these two until I got to know them better. Um, and anyway, I said, hey, you mentioned that this uh, would be optimized away, but I tried it and it, uh, this is what it did, and it didn't work. And then. Matthew said, oh, yes, but I tried it with 0 0.2 back then, and it worked. Uh, Songo, what did you do? And then Songo, oh, let's have a look. Um, and then three hours later, I think, he said, oh, yeah, I, I found a problem. I regressed. I, I fixed it and was uploading a new version. And sure enough, if you run <coughs> compile this with 0 0.4 and 0 0.1, um, then here's the manual version as before. And here's a generic version. <laughs> oh. So TNT actually detects that the two versions are the same and just makes one an alias for the other one. Wow. Which is a very convincing way of now making their point. So what has happened here? Um, what has happened is that somebody wrote an advanced Haskell library, carefully crafted, with a promise that a certain optimization will kick in at compile time um, when you use the library in a certain way. And this promise was not true for a released version. It was true for a version before, and 0 0.2 obviously had the property that Matthew was checking. But, um, but somehow, there were some things in place to make sure that these things stay true. And this is not a single incident. So here's a second anecdote, just to um, show you how prevalent, pre pre um, prevalent this is. Um, you might have used this data type. Who has used data types? <coughs> okay, everybody else, stop using the string, use data text if you talk about text. And this is one of the most popular libraries for human readable text. And part of the documentation has a section here, Fusion, where it says that basically if you write a pipeline of functions that produce text values and consume text values, and if all of these functions are marked as uh, subject to Fusion, then the compiler will actually transform the sequence where you, it looks like it's taking one text value and giving a new one and then doing something and producing a new one into a one tied loop where it just does all the steps in, in one, one loop over the end. This is very similar to what we've heard in, in, the, um, in the keynote today. And this is, this is one of the things that, I, that make me proud as Haskell user. It's these kind of big, far reaching transformations um, that probably wouldn't even be possible in a language with side effects and, and, and the laziness and things. Um, so really, this is something I, I boost with when I talk to people that do see you or something. So here's a claim again, and um, I guess you can see where this is going. <laughs> so I copied literally the same code into a file, and now I compile this with 8.2 with optimization on, um, I want the code sim the simplified code to be dumped, and just to to make the output less verbose, um, suppressing some of the bookkeeping around the core. And 
So here's the code. And okay, maybe before we look at the code, what what, what, um, what am I looking for? So the claim is that um, that there's that all the intermediate values of type text disappear. And in this particular instance, it's nice that the input here is a byte string, so it's just raw bytes. It's not text, different data type, and the output is an int. So the only text values that we have at all are the intermediate ones, the one that's here and the one that's here. So I would expect that if this promise holds, there will be no more construction and deconstruction of text values in the code. And I happen to know that the data type text is defined with a constructor called text. So I think I'll look for the code, look through the code and see if I can find any mentions of the text data type. Sorry, text data constructor. So I mean, this is really a lot of code that I don't want to read through, but we can search for text. And it, indeed, there, is a, there are two cases where we construct a text value. And, and further down, we also have a case where we uh, pattern match in the value to get a constructor of type, uh, to get a text data constructor. So again, we see that the, the promise was, was false. And I guess I didn't know that at that time, but I've learned a bit more. Um, this fusion technique used in data text is called stream fusion, um, which, is, which uses constructors done and skip and yield, but they should always be intermediate. Like the compiler should optimize them away. Otherwise, stream fusion didn't do what it's supposed to be doing. And indeed, we find that there are still mentions of skip and yield in that. So the, the compiler didn't optimize the code the way that the authors originally um, envisioned. Um, okay, so again, there was a promise made. It was a promise of an, um, that didn't really affect the correctness of the code. Like in both cases, something didn't happen, but the programs would still do the, the right thing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see any tests failing or something. It's just that something that should have happened about the intermediate code didn't happen, likely with the effect that it's going to be slower, but even that is not a, not a given. But still, it shouldn't happen. And I think presented like this, the question of how do we fix this problem is kind of obvious. Well, manually testing these things is tedious. We've seen it's, it's kind of a lot of work to look at the core and, and check these things for every change, like after every change you made to the library, which is unfeasible, which explains why these things are broken. So we need to automate it. And this is basically the, the core idea that I want to present here. And in order to to make this idea, or to plant this idea more firmly into people's head, I'm trying to give it a name. So I'm trying to coin this definition, inspection testing. Well, this slide is a little bit dry, but I still want to go through it, um, where I try to clearly define what inspection testing is about and, and what it isn't, and how to distinguish it from other techniques of quality assurance. So the first one I just mentioned is inspection testing really cares about non-functional properties, something that don't show up when you write a test suite and write test cases. Uh, because we know how to test functional correctness uh, well enough, especially in Haskell with like fiction. It's, um, it's amazing how good that is. But it only captures um, functional properties. And then this should be about a compilation artifact, such as the intermediate code after optimization, or maybe the assembly code, not the source code directly. We couldn't tell this in the source code because source code checkers, linters, all exist, all are right there. Right. People know about that. We don't need to add that here. Um, in fact, this thing applies to a specific piece of code, or maybe a class of code, like certain pipelines. In contrast to properties that hold for all Haskell programs, such as type safety, like unless you use unsafe features, uh, we can prove, or we can, I guess we hope, for Haskell we hope it only, but we could prove that it's type correct, it doesn't have any um, type errors at runtime. Whereas inspection testing is really something you need to, to look at a concrete piece of code. Um, it needs to be a, what, what do we test? It needs to be a property that is specified. And this is actually interesting, because you will see that people who write high performance test code, they will maybe look at the intermediate code after optimization and look through it and think, oh, this looks good. Nothing bad, nothing strange happening. Which is completely useful. I mean, I'm not gonna say this is a bad idea, it just means you can't automate it. You need to, you need to find out what are you looking for. And once you know what you're looking for, well, we wanted to be able for the programmer to declare the intent in contrast to just, I mean, you could imagine you're 
to write a, oh, let's get that. Um, and then the, and then obviously, it's already useful to declare things, and we've seen this, the test li the text library, it declares that certain functions um, are marked as uh, subject to fusion, and you see there's 49 hits here, so there's a bunch of functions that are supposed to be fusing, so we, the library author already declared which functions are supposed to be doing it. What was missing was that, well, we need to test it, we need to check it. And we want to check it by the compiler itself, and not just some external tool, because really we want to make the connection between the property and the code that you will run in the end. And you will run the program code that comes out of the compiler, not some other tool that might or might not match what the compiler is doing, because really you want to care what the particular compiler uses. All right, um, so much for the abstract definition. What are some things we might, might find, what are some things that might fall under this umbrella of inspection testing? And we've seen um, two examples already, so equality between generic code and manually written code is a good example, because functionally they are the same, but really you want to know that the generic version doesn't have any runtime over it, which is not automatic. You need to caref be careful about optimizations for this term. We've seen the one about eliminating intermediate data structures. Um, another popular request that came and is implemented now is um, Haskell programmers like to write polymorphic code, lots of type classes to hide implementation and to separate concerns, but type classes are not for free. If, if compiled naively, then a type class is a record of functions that are being passed to your code, so there's lots of indirections, there are function calls to unknown functions that are more expensive than if you call a complete function where you know the function you're calling. Um, and in many cases, GFG can optimize it away by specializing the code to the type class you're using, by inlining. So maybe you want to check that certain piece of code, there's no type class overhead anymore. And there's a bunch of similar things. And the last one I want to point out is the value that so far all of them are kind of about performance, but really inspection testing isn't only about performance. It could be any other property that you care about. Uh, a good example here is if you have code that deals with private data, like secret keys and cryptographic code, you really don't want your code to make um, branches based on code flow decisions based on secret data, because this opens up the possibility for side channel attacks. Um, and checking the absence of branches, as I think, falls under this umbrella because it's non-functional property. You can't test whether there was a branch as long as it's doing doing the same computation. But really, you need to look at the at the artifacts, either the assembly or the um, yeah, probably the assembly. And if you have more ideas or if you have more needs for your project, then uh, well, come to me. Okay, so we've seen the problem. We have an idea what the solution should look like. So let's make it more concrete. If we, if this was Christmas, we could make wishes. How would we like this to look? How would we want this to look? And, and maybe visual thinking would guide us to something like this. So this is my Haskell code. Um, I have defined my manual lens and my generic lens. And now, ideally, I just enable a language extension, which is Haskell's way of adding more features to the language in a conservative way. And I want to enable the language extension that I can do inspection testing. And then I have this new top-level declaration thing where I say, dear compiler, please inspect that hlens manual is the same as hlens generic. And then the compiler would do the, the check uh, when it compiles it. So this would, would be nice. And I guess TLG is open source. I could just fork it and, and add these things, but it, it's kind of not productive. I want, to get my, I want to get this extension out to people. So they don't want to, truly they don't want to just to create, uh, install a custom version of THG to get this. Uh, interestingly, we can almost get there with existing tools in THG. So instead of creating a new syntactic top-level declaration for inspection, we can use template Haskell, which allows us to, to run code that looks like a top-level command. You'll see the moment. And then instead of changing the compiler to the checks, uh, GHG has a plugin system, which was meant for adding new optimizations. So you can add a new, a new plugin that takes code and transforms it to make it maybe faster. Um, but you can also use this plugin to, well, look at the code, and if it do, you don't like it, you just kill the compiler uh, by exiting. 
Um, so with these two hacks, I, I can actually implement this, and um, let's let's try. It. Um, so here we have our. Okay. Um, Um, our two versions. We can import test inspection and we want to and then we can say inspect um, that this is the same as and then we need to do a slight adjustments to allow for syntax so really want to pass this argument and we need to add quotes in front of the names because they are template Haskell. We want, to, oh, we want to reference the name, we don't want to call the function here. Um, and in order, because we're using template Haskell, we need to enable the template Haskell language extension. And with this in place, we can um, compile this. We don't need to dump the simple anymore. And now it's compiling, it's not complaining, so uh, everything's fine. Great, so we do the old version. Uh, it's, it's compiling, it's not complaining. Okay, we didn't load the plugin. If we don't load the plugin, nothing can complain. So we also need to say that we want to use the test inspection. So it's not quite as neat as the, wish, like the, the wishful thinking version. But it's very close. Like we add template has built and the plugin, uh, we import an external library, and now we can use this declaration, which almost looks like a top level declaration. And with this now in place, I can compile it with the version that works. Uh, sorry, typo. Plugin, okay. Um, and the plugin kicks in and finds this obligation we put in the code. It checks that they are the same. After optimization, it says everything's great. And we can check it with the old version. Um, and if you do this here, it says, oh, didn't work, and prints out the very long uh, content of the two files. And, and now this checking is really fast. Like previously, I had to look through the code. But now it's just a command, which means, for example, it's really simple to um, try a different version of the compiler. So, the generic events people, they want to support a, a certain range of compiler versions. So they, I reported this problem, they fixed it in 0 0.4.0.1 for GHG 8.2, which is what the version they were using then. And then they started using my library, and this made it so efficient to check these things that it's really just a few seconds to try a different GHG version. And it turns out that the fixed version fixed it for GHG 8.2, uh, but not 8.0. Um, but now they have the tooling to make these kind of checks, and they can automate these checks, and they can run it in the CI. So really, there was no problem then to, to detect this and release a new version, which now has it fixed for 8.0 uh, and 8.2. So um, yeah, right, so we did this. Um, so far, so good. Let's, what about the text example? So remember, okay, so may, what, I, what I can do is I can easily look at the pipeline that we've created so far and write an inspection obligation that says um, that this count just doesn't have any, doesn't mention the type text anymore. And I can do that, and that's fine. But this is just checking this particular pipeline. There are 49 functions in this library um, that are supposed to be fusing, and then there's data text and data text lazy, which doubles the whole problem space. So really, this doesn't scale yet. But the good thing is that, well, we have template Haskell, which is meta-level programming, uh, meta-programming for, for Haskell, and we already saw that we specify our obligations using template Haskell. So we can just write code that automatically generates lots of these obligations. Um, and so we're a little program that uh, so fusion fuzzy 
Yeah, essentially. So I wrote a little program that um, how do you display errors because that might be so right now I think it's compiling um, a bunch of pipelines and once it's done, so I can make the plugin not fail when it publication fails, but rather insert a true or false into the code and then the running the final code can actually print the result. So we'll see that in a mo moment once it's done. So there are lots of compiling happening. Um, can you generate a list of failing? Uh, so oh, yeah. we get something like this where I can go through all the functions that I'm supposed to be fusing and then I automatically generate, I think, four pipelines with this function in together with other functions that I'm, I know are supposed to be good. And I can check whether um, the first check mark means, okay, unpack string is supposed to be fusing, but actually doesn't. And I can not only do that, I can actually create random pipelines and check whether they fuse when they should be fusing. And I can also check whether they maybe, maybe they're fusing, even though the documentation doesn't say it's fusing. And for the demo, I just have 20. It was already compiled long enough, but I can run this for an hour and test like a thousand pipelines. Um, and then I get a result like this, where I find that in data text, I think there are 13 functions where it's like wrong, 11 that are supposed to be fusing, but they aren't, and two that are not documented to be fusing, actually they do, which I guess is a bug in the mutation. Um, <laughs> weird, it's good, isn't it? Um, and then the same for data text lazy. And checking these things at that scale was completely impossible before. Which makes you wonder, I can, it takes a certain boldness to make these claims about fusion if, if they are, I mean, they are, they, they are brittle. The compile optimizations can easily go wrong. So without this kind of testing, um, you can't really rely on that. But, but now you, you can, and you can put this into your test suite, and you can just automatic test every commit against all versions of THG that you care about. And you get a much higher assurance that these things aren't working the way they should. Um, so as I said, it's it's somewhat specific uh, the audience for this library. You need to be writing up a Haskell library that does advanced stuff with optimizations that you can express this way. So there's a but I'm, I'm still happy that there's like a fair number of libraries starting to use it now, and and the, I guess half of them are by Oleg, so maybe that's not, not fair. But um, the people who use it are very happy about it. So, um, yeah, that's um, what I have to tell you. I'm looking forward to all your questions. that it's all non-recursive. Um, so I actually don't know how I would do for recursive data structures, but basically TG is very good at optimizing things that are not recursive. Like inlining of a large function is fine, inlining a small recursive function is really hard because it's recursive so you can't just keep inlining it or it might be dangerous. Um, and oh, and I think there's a trick somewhere. I'm actually not sure if this came up in this context, but um, if you want, oh yeah, yeah, I think that at least in, in one of these libraries, um, oh yeah, uh, fin and back, um, there are some type level nuts and vectors where the guarantee is that if the size of the type level vector is known and you do a map over it, GHG will inline, unroll the map completely, which is a recursive thing, so it's surprising that they do it, and they found a trick where you use type classes instead of normal functions. Um, to do the recursion because GHG inlines type classes more aggressive than normal code and then you can do that. And I'm actually not sure if the generic license library has a similar trick where they rely on type classes being inlined or type class dictionaries being inlined more aggressively. Um, but uh, I guess if you really care about this, Tongo um, will be the person to happily tell you about it, how they made this reliable. Like I only told them when it broke. I never told them how to fix it. <laughs> yeah, in the back there. So one perspective on, on testing 
years would also be that GHC is ultimately the Haskell program that takes an abstract syntax tree and outputs a, a core abstract syntax tree. So uh, can't you just contribute test cases to the GHC project and say, oh, here, one test case, just download generic lens and make sure those two core things are the same? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so an interesting aspect of part of your question is that what I frame as something new, inspection testing here, becomes normal testing when you look at the compiler. But um, the compiler is, build, is providing building blocks, inline rules and things, and you can test these individually, but testing a concrete combination of all of them, that's not really a, like, a problem of the compiler, it's the silly library that's composing these things. So, I mean, you can put it as a regression test into DHE and it would be useful, but still, you still want to test this as part of the library. Um, yeah. I guess you were master. I would argue that ex at least for like the Haskell-based text, byte string, everything that's, that's distributed with GHC, the compiler should care about these tests. They, uh, should have, they, they shouldn't release a new version where they break some of their dependent libraries without uh, checking. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's a point for Basically, any kind of Haskell program out there that being broken by GHC is bad, whether it's this kind of property or anything else. So, any any program out there kind of deserves being a, a regression test. There's you need some to that cut are the line somewhere. More um, relied on like text or by yeah. string. I mean, there's work in the place to um, test all of stackage with GHC hat and with every commit. So we we will notice breakage even in some random pandoc executable more quickly this way. And if you include these kind of tests there as well, then you get this effect. But I don't think it's specific to, to inspection testing. I think the same holds for any other kind of breakage you can do. Good. More questions? We still have two minutes or so. Record. Um, so how, uh, how inventive did you have to be to be able to specify the requirements? Because uh, for some requirements, I can imagine it's, it's not too hard, like what you showed, like this should be equal to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you think about something like uh, this should not be slower than X, or um, so even the branching thing, how, how would you specify that actually? So X would not be slower than Y wouldn't fall under this definition because it's a dynamic property. You can't tell that statically. Oh, okay. No branching is kind of simple. You just look through the code and you see if there's a case expression that's more than one branch. Oh, okay. So really I'm looking for things you can do statically. <coughs> There's a, a point that some people made that you can like you can include dynamic properties in inspection testing, um, like runtime. But I kind of at least so far I focused on things I can actually check at compile time. Okay. Another answer I can give you is that so far the inspection testing library, uh, which I guess I should mention is um, uh, is on an package you can use it in, in things and it has documentation a little bit. Um, so it. It defines a, a fairly small number of obligations you can specify. Um, basically, this is the current definition, so things can be equal, uh, certain types can be absent, no education of type classes, uh, certain values are absent. So it's kind of a kitchen thing. Whatever people need, I can add. Um, at some point in the future, maybe we'll have more insight into what people actually need, and we can provide some fancy DSL to compose these properties more nicely, and maybe also to focus more closely and say, I don't want type classes in the inner loop of the function over there, but outside the inner loop, it's fine. So there's a lot of things we can do there. So far, the approach is just scratch the interest and learn what people need. Good. One more uh, short question, please. Yeah. Do you know if this approach has been used in other compilers? Um, so in a way, you will find this in every compiler test suite itself. Like all the compiler test suites have them. And for example, LLVM has this file check tool, which is basically a fancy way of grabbing textually through the textual representation of the intermediate code. Um, I haven't really seen prior art that is closer to what I do than that. Um, I, I guess there are some applications where you have meta-level programming or um, like macros and Lisp and things, and where you could check the output of the macro for certain properties. But since it's not really the compiler optimizing anything, it's really just your code running on an AST and producing an AST, it feels like it's more normal testing there. But if you know anything, I'm happy to hear about 
other related work. Uh, I think I got the paper accepted without um, listening too much related work, so at least the reviewers didn't know any. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah.